didn't understand a word he said, but welcome to the Rooftop Show. This is Rudy Reyes. I am live right here on the Two Lights Dudes Radio Network. I am your host, Rudy Reyes, and I welcome you to another fantastic hour of sports talk radio. Make sure you go to Spreaker, download the app, and tune in via Facebook Live as well. I am live. Welcome to the Rude Dog Show. Well, today is different from the last, but the passion and fire still remains the same for anyone trying to make sense out of either where they're headed, albeit personally or professionally, heading in the right direction contains a variety of twists and turns. However, the desired outcome can sometimes be, well, unpredictable, as everybody has probably figured out at this point. But is the fastest route sometimes the best route? No, not necessarily, because it's not how you start, it's how you finish. The young and talented players in this world, of course you know exactly who I'm talking to. And similar to that, the gentleman I have here on the show, who joins me, who finds himself halfway across the country, or just say fully across, I don't know what the word half between full, but you know, glass is half full versus half empty. But he's on the show to talk about his humble upbringing, how he's excelling, where he's at currently, and his personal aspirations, which keeps driving him forward. Everybody has a force. Everybody has a push. Everybody has something that drives them to get them to the next level, whatever that is. And you look at a guy who is from, uh, I'm going to give the bad Jersey accent, New Jersey. Uh, I really tried. Who's traveled far and wide, including San Bernardino, California, my hometown. Yes, I put myself there. Maybe not now, but in the 80s I did. Yes. <laughs> Germany, Jacksonville, Florida, with the Jacksonville Sharks, has played in Switzerland. And now in Finland. Welcome, the Welcome. <laughs> Farley, welcome, Danny, to the show. How are you? May have a disconnect there. Danny, are you with me? I guess that is a no. Anyway, Danny Farley is a, a well-traveled guy. He's been around. He's been back and forth, East Coast, West Coast. That's what he does. Danny, are you with me? He's calling for Finland, everybody. I mean, you have to really... Um, <laughs> You have to give it up for somebody who's still, it's nine, what is it, nine o'clock over there or something to that effect? Danny, are you with me here on the show? Danny, are you there? Gonna have to uh, have him call back. Anyway, Danny Farley is a guy who, again, well-traveled, been the East Coast, West Coast, back to the East Coast, back to the West Coast, And when you look at a guy like Danny Farley, he, he started out a very long time ago. And I don't make it sound like 15 years ago, but Danny has been a quarterback with a variety of well, universities. Small colleges, Delaware, but Danny, are you with me? Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Danny. I appreciate it. Welcome to the show. How are you? I know you're, I know it's late. What time is it there in Finland? Danny, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. What time is it there in Finland right now? It is currently 11.05 p.m. 11.05 p.m. So it's close to midnight there and it's only five in the afternoon here in the U.S. Yes, of course. Happy to be on. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Look, uh, as I aforementioned, things couldn't have started any more humble for you growing up in town or Boonton Township in New Jersey. You attended to Paul Catholic School in Wayne, New Jersey. So basically, hop, skip, and a jump is not very big. It's not that New Jersey is just big, gigantic like California. But you made the decision to not only play football, but you were determined to start at the varsity level. 
What initially drove you to even want to play football to begin with? Danny, what are your thoughts about that? About wanting to play football early yeah. on in life? We have a dis we have a we have a connection problem here, but we're gonna roll, we're gonna roll, it's all good. When you started playing football at DePaul Catholic School, what was it about wanting to play? What was wanting to play the game of football that really had you determined and rearing to go moving forward? No, connection problems. Good old Finland. Are you there? Danny, are you with me? Are you with me, Danny? I can't quite hear you. Anyway, Danny started a long time ago. There was a lot of decisions to want to play football. I guarantee he weighed a lot. His checks and balances, everything in, a, in accordance with what he was trying to accomplish and everything to do with starting off from the beginning. You seem to have a connection problem there and I hear it in the background. Are you with me, Danny? I look at Danny's travels. He's been here, he's been there, he's been everywhere. And you can probably think of this on everywhere, man. I've been. No, no, Danny's been out in a variety of places, but all one position remains the same, and that is under center. And I look at the under center position, that's not something that predominantly you want to change. I mean, if you're going to start there, if you're going to go there, if you're going to travel across the country to play in that position, there are other teams that are looking for guys who want to start under center. Danny, are you back with me here on the show? I take that as a no. <laughs> I'll try to get him back on here in a moment. Excuse me. We're going to try to get him back on the show here. But Danny's been around. He's traveled from the East Coast. That's where he started from. And he's been a variety of places. And all of this, all of this in his junior year. And hopefully, Hello. hopefully we get Danny back. Are you, are you on a headset or something, Danny? No, I'm actually just on the phone here. Oh, okay. Well, you know, again, it is the connection. It does happen. So, look, you progress. I mean, you, you wanted to play football. It was at DePaul Catholic School in Wayne, New Jersey. Why did you want to play football? Um, I grew up playing a game my whole life. Um, it was something I always wanted to do, play professionally. And uh, I was obviously a three-year starter at DePaul before I got hurt my senior year. And then um, I basically was fully committed to it once I gave up baseball and basketball as a freshman in high school. So I decided to go to a prep school, replay my senior year. And uh, that led me to having a pretty good season over there, helped lead my team in a bunch of big big wins. Ended up getting a bunch of Ivy League interest as I was basically first team all New England quarterback. And then uh, I took my talent over to San Bernardino Valley College in Southern California. That is a long trip. <laughs> you're talking about, you're, you're in the East Coast, you're used to the area, you know the weather. It's, you know, it's something that must be said. Now, I've been back east. I don't know that far back east. <laughs> back east. Very mm -hmm. different scenery, very different dynamics. And did you feel that the quarterback position was something you were going to continue to do, or was yeah. there another skill position that you felt you could have possibly played in if the quarterback was not the answer? No, I mean, I always wanted to be a quarterback. I knew I was gifted with that. Um, my ability to just make throws, go through reads, process information in the pocket, um, buy time with my feet. Um, it's, it's the best position on the field, in my opinion, and I was really determined to end up getting that full scholarship because going in my senior year, I had a lot of interest from a lot of big schools before the injury. I had a lot of verbal scholarship offers and uh, 
they all got pulled away from me, obviously, once I got hurt. So I went over to junior college and played for a very good coach, Kevin Emerson. He taught me a lot of the game, had a lot of success over there. Some of my best friends to this day were actually on that roster with me. And uh, from there, I ended up going to play at University of Rhode Island, and I earned that full ride. So. When I look at, well, look, San Bernardino Valley College, I mean, the, the university itself is, you know, San Bernardino's a big place, but to have a college that has a football team, to be honest with you, I didn't know they had one. Why? Because I, A, never attended that college. Secondly, I had Valley College right down the street in Colton, so if I wanted to attend a junior college, I could have certainly went there to do it. But you found a way to progress and recognize that that position was obviously right for you, and you, you knew in advance that you could excel in it, but in your varsity season, there were some ways to recognize your weaknesses and ways to overcome those weaknesses to turn them into strengths. What were those weaknesses and how did you approach it in such a way that allowed for you to turn those into positives? Um, basically just, you know, as you the process of it, you're playing games, you're gaining game experience, you're really learning how to read coverage, how to break down film, you're learning your body still, you're learning how to train, how to strengthen your arm, how to strengthen your legs, you're becoming mentally more tough the more you go through in life, and I definitely took a big jump after missing my senior season in high school, and then you look at me going to prep school, I progressed there, and then I ended up going to play at Valley College in San Bernardino. There was five or six quarterbacks on the depth chart, and we battled every day for playing time. And that taught me a lot, taught me to really be mentally tough and go through the process of things. And in the end, I'm very fortunate that I came out with as, like some great stats, some great film and just overall experience and knowledge of the game. My coach over there, he really taught me a lot about watching them, looking at weaknesses and strengths of defense, looking at coverages, looking at leverage, numbers, counting the box, all that type of stuff. Yeah, at that point, did you realize that you were becoming a student of the game? Because even though you may have not been starting at some point, you felt as though that you learned enough to maybe start a coaching career after this is all said and done, after your football career has retired itself. Yes, definitely. I mean, I think that once, whenever I do get done playing, I basically got a master's degree now at this point, being 26, went through a lot of schools, went through a lot of different systems, and uh, overall just constantly learning new knowledge, new offensive schemes, new different philosophies, sitting in film rooms and sitting in classrooms with a lot of different coaches with a lot of different thought processes on what their reads are with certain plays, coverages, concepts, stuff like that. Um, definitely at the end of the day, whenever I do get done playing, hopefully it's not anytime soon, I'll end up getting into coaching for sure. Hopefully so. I mean, when you learn enough from one different skill set, at some point, you're going to say, you know what, I'm ready for this, I'm done with playing, and I'll feel comfortable in that role, being able to execute and do the things that I need to do. So I can execute, my quarterback will also be able to execute. That's the ideology of an offensive coordinator or a quarterback coach. Yes, or, exactly. You know, uh, so let's, let's go a little bit backwards. Let's talk about your sophomore year. There were some special attention or rather aspects that you needed to further refine as you headed into your sophomore season. Was there anything that you recognized that you needed to either work out or did you feel as though that through game progression would allow you to work those small issues out? Um, you know, my sophomore year, I put on probably 15 to 20 pounds, which is what my school wanted me to do. And uh, I ended up learning how to I'm, I'm always constantly trying to become better mechanically, becoming more accurate, gaining arm strength, and um, I did a lot of powerlifting that year. And I ended up being used in a lot of situations, even during games and practices where they put me in in wildcat formations when I was at Rhode Island, and uh, I ran the ball a lot. Um, but overall, I think as a sophomore, the biggest thing for me was just continuing to identify coverages, 
identify just reads pre-snap, reads post-snap, mastering the playbook, and just overall game experience itself. Game experience is invaluable. You can learn everything on paper. You can you know write your X's and O's, but going out there to execute is basically a different monster altogether. Did you feel as though that what you would learn in the classroom would translate on the field to not only make you a productive quarterback, especially in those maybe third long situations, you had stated they put you in a maybe like a two back set or or, or a sneaker uh, type situation on third or maybe even fourth down to get into the end zone. But did you feel so you were being utilized? I'm the back of the here for the most part, and um, I was put into some tough situations that I'm back on it now and thank on to those situations. Um, a lot of times when you get in there on third and short, or even like second and short, the whole stadium knows that they're bringing in a quarterback here to run the ball, and um, you basically learn how to really identify numbers, identify where the holes are, just the fronts, how to count the box, where you're going to be able to get yardage. And that's something that you have to literally go through the process with and play with. So, Well, sometimes as a trial by fire, you're out there, you're doing everything possible, you're doing what the coach is telling you, but it doesn't produce results. How much frustration did that build in you to find that whatever you tried to do did not achieve the results, not because of one person, but because of the collective effort or lack thereof? It definitely motivated me. Um, when I transferred out of there, it definitely lit a fire under me that I was all in this. And I think because of that, I have came a long way even from my sophomore year to my junior year, and then from my junior year to my senior year. I'm more motivated as you the process of things, obviously the success you want. And in the end, it can end up turning to be a blessing for you sometimes down the road, especially when you stick with it. You're right. You it's learn a lot. Exactly. You learn a lot more. You pour your heart and soul into it. You become like a lot more adapted to each environment. Situations don't really phase you as much. Right, that's exactly, that's kind of where I was going with that. Speaking of your senior season, there was a tragedy that had stricken you. Okay, for those out there listening, this is Rudy Rance the Dog Show on Two Lights News Radio Network. But when I say tragedy, I don't mean something extremely dire, but to you it was. Despite being voted team captain by your peers, you managed to break your index finger on your throwing hand while playing at Giant Stadium in your very first senior game. Look, it's a tough situation. I've spoken to a ton of athletes, Hall of Famers, student athletes, and it's not the accident, it's not the situation itself, it's how you handle it. You're talking about the situations yourself and how you were able to persevere to say, you know what, this is not, this, this isn't defining, this isn't going to keep me down. You can say no, you can put me in the backup, I can hurt straight, but I'm still going to persevere and manage to fight my way through, and that's exactly what you applied to the broken finger. And... Is it safe to say that you were very disappointed in your initial reaction to would I ever play again? Or maybe even is my starting job safe because of the injury? Am I am I close there in some in some capacity? Yes, definitely. I mean, I can remember that night like it was yesterday. I ended up going to the emergency room with my mom and uh, I got x rays. Doctor came in, he said I'm gonna need surgery. Um, nights like that really don't go away from you. Um, you really, I thought about it quite long. I broke down a little bit in that moment, but obviously with surgery, I knew I was going to keep playing. Um, and I didn't give up with it. So, well, you learned a lot from that experience. I mean, obviously don't Nobody wants to go through that. Nobody wants their finger broken. Nobody wants to go through concussion protocol. Nobody wants to get involved in a car accident, but, but things like this do happen on a football field or in life in the of a football field. When you're talking about injury, and again, because I've spoken to so many, there's one constant, and the constant is it's not the injury, it's what you do to prepare a comeback. And I could quote many songs about comebacks, don't call it a comeback, or 
you know, going back to Cali or whatever that is, whatever narrative you want to insert there. Did what aspect did you feel contributed to your desire to even want to come back from this broken finger? I wanted the full scholarship. Um, and just overall just playing the game. I love football. I'm always gonna love football. That's why I'm still playing it now. Um, just overall when you go through experiences like that, it really, really makes you just you commit to yourself mentally, you commit your you commit yourself physically, you're going to go through the rehab, you're going to train, you're going to get back, you're going to start throwing again. That stuff motivates you. Mostly when you're doing something that you love, like, like playing the game itself, you're going to do all that you can to come back from something like that. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. So many times where when I feel that I'm down and out, I always recognize that it could always be worse. There's always something more that I'm dealing with or that I could be dealing with. And again, it's not a, it's not the situation. It's how you deal with the situation. You dealt with it extremely well. Let's move a little bit forward where you found yourself in a situation to rebound, but you'd have to travel out to Connecticut at the prep school while you attended. You were you had drawn up uh, athletic accolades, being captain named for the second time in a different school. All New England Cup honors, we were talking about the earlier while at quarterback. But the interest was growing and you received an Ivy League nod not in a far yet distant college. Yes, it was in the West Coast of Severino Valley College under Coach Emerson. You did fantastic things while you were there. I don't know that uh, I don't know that you were not scouted. I, you know, there's no way to really know. You can look in the stands and you don't know who's who. You, you see family, you see friends, but people are often looking right in their notebooks or sending text messages or what have you. I think that you were scouted. I think that's one of the reasons why you received that full scholarship because uh, Rhode Island needed somebody of your your stature, your acumen, your IQ. But what was it about having to travel yet again across the country back to the East Coast after leaving San Bernardino Valley College? I mean, was there anything respective about the college other than the, the fellows and, and friends that are still on that roster right now? And possibly even every touch that you helped create while you were there? Yeah, I mean, San Bernardino is Southern California. I spent a year over there playing with those guys. Um, I really love California. And playing with those guys and going to class over there, it was the first time I really got away from home and I learned how to really handle everything I'm, like, on my own. Between just social environments, gaining friends, learning how to really being in a college system the right way. And I had a very good coach who brought me in over there who taught me a lot about other games. So I'm very thankful for my time over in San Bernardino. Do you, do you still keep in touch with, with Coach Emerson from, from time to time? Is there a communicate between you guys so he can kind of see your progress and where you're headed to right now? Do you still keep in touch with, with Coach Emerson? I'm here, John Carp. Now oh, drop it off again. Hey, you got to love Finland. <laughs> I don't know how secure that was there. I mean, it was good for what it was. Later. <laughs> Danny, are you there? Yeah, it keeps cutting off. You'll have to give me a call back. I don't know if you can hear me, but give me a call back, please. But like, there's a road well-traveled for Danny. And... I look at what he's gone through, what he's dealt with, what he continues to strive for, which is that full scholarship. He said that a myriad of times so far in this conversation. Danny, are you back? Yes. Okay, back. great. Thank you. I was asking about Coach Jefferson. Were you still in with him? Does he still send you emails or anything of that nature to follow up with you? Yes. I ended up sending him my film, actually. Um, and I've, I've touched base with him once in a while here and there. He's busy. He's over at coaching at a Gulf Coast College right now, over in Orange County. And um, he's still doing great with all his accolades over there. He's a very knowledgeable coach. I still talk to my quarterback coach from San Bernardino time and time again, John Carlo, John Carlo Vitello, who's actually coaching high school right now. 
Yeah, having a connection issue over there. That's okay. We're, we're going to roll with it. So there are some things that Denny's dealt with and, you know, continues to strive, continues to grind, continues to put in the work and continues to do everything that he needs to do in order to help make it a reality for him to get to the next level into the NFL. And it, it's not an easy road. It's not It's not an easy road for anybody to be on when you're having to travel east to, to west coast, back to east coast, back to the west coast. Are you back with us, Dan? Are you back? I have such a connection problem here today. I don't know what's going on there. But we're going to keep rolling here. Danny, are you back with us? Hello? Yeah. Danny, are you back? Yeah. Okay, great. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I, we have a, some connection problems. Got to love technology, everybody. Got to love technology. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, but that's sure. okay. So you still keep in touch with former coach and Sam Dino, and what's really interesting is that you not only and this is a Rude Dog show on the Two Life Crew Radio Network, and I'm your host Rudy Reyes. Danny, when I look at the the roads well traveled, the skies well traveled for you rather. And now you're headed back to the East Coast. You're going to Rhode Island. They've given you the opportunity after being promised a medical. Red shirt, but sometimes happen. You know, things do exist that aren't exactly favorable, and that's exactly what happens here. Look, coaching staff changes. People move in and out. Head coaches, assistant coaches, quarterback coaches, offensive coordinators, and such. But when you look at the types of changes, did it really surprise you that they did not put your paperwork through the system, having already played two games? Could you repeat that? I said, was there anything, I mean, were you amazed by, after playing two games, that your paperwork still was not filed in with the university? One more time. (laughs) That's all right. Were you, did you in any way, shape, or form, and in any way, think, ponder, maybe pontificate, that the university, because you'd already played two games, were you shocked that they had not put your paperwork through the system? Um, just the situation with my paperwork. It was just a tough situation. Um, I thought that I should have got more playing time, and uh, I got I got prompt medical redshirt, and that obviously didn't come through. And um, I decided to transfer at that point. And just overall, like. It was disappointing, but it kept it kept me to keep staying motivated, and it actually led to me coaching for a year over in junior college in East LA before I found my next home, and that was Delaware Valley University as a junior. Yeah, that this is really weird. And again, traveling back to, again to the West Coast, somehow you found us another opportunity in the sport of football, and that was to coach in another unlikely place, and that is East Los Angeles Community College, and a teenager A degree in political science at that point. However, you also looking for a different opportunity back on the East Coast with Delaware. I mean, having familiarity with the college system, at least by this time, and understanding those dynamics, I mean, what was it like being a coach for the first time? Um, it was different. I was in the room more. I helped out with the quarterbacks a lot. I helped out with the offense coordinator. And I actually, rather than being on the field, I was up in the booth for all those games. Well, that's, it, it, it's and amazing. Plays. Yeah, it was I mean, really good. The disconnect, I don't know where it is, so I had to chime in here. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it was very different for you because the, you're not on the field this time. You're sitting back, you're on the sidelines. You're making the calls, you're making the hand signals, and all, all of these variety of, of things. Did you work in conjunction with the offensive coordinator and the coach? And if so, what was that experience like? It was different um, in practice. Obviously, I was helping out with the quarterbacks, helping like run drills and stuff like that. But in the games, usually I was up in the booth with the offensive coordinator, and we were constantly just looking at defenses, just coming up with new plays, what to run. It was really 
fun experience. That's a great staff over there that I really like. They're great people. I had a lot of fun with them. I'll tell you this much. When you look at that coaching position from a different angle, was it really hard to stay on the sideline? Or did you feel as though, you, because you already knew that you could play, you were still in the playing mode, you were still actively searching. Did you at any point whatsoever think, well, this is not something I want to do, and I'd rather be out on this field doing it for this team? Um, I mean, you always have that itch. You always want to be playing, especially when you're trying to get back to a college where you're trying to get a scholarship again. Um, but overall, that situation, I learned a lot. It was a good experience for me. And it's definitely something that got me to think, like, long-term, potentially, I could be a really good coach doing this. So I really enjoyed it. Um, I was always talking at schools that came through. I was always recruiting like trying to get myself out there with marketing purposes and stuff like that. So in all in all, it was just another stepping stone that helped me learn a lot. Well, it's about the grind, but it's a different type of grind when you're a coach. It's the coaching grind. I think when it's all said and done and you learn from all your experiences, you chalk up life's experiences, saying this is where I've been, I understand. I know not to do this. I know not to do that. And be able to really put it all together in a life's a lifetime worth of situations that you can go back and say, you know what, I did the best I could like anybody else, but now here I am doing this once I retire from football. But something changed after you swapped over to Delaware Valley University, again, charted back to the East Coast. You started seven games, you helped your team get to a 6-1 record before formations and ultimately the entire offense changed. Were you being, do you, did you feel as though you are being squeezed out of the game, at least at Delaware Valley University? Um, I was definitely a little bit frustrated with the situation. Um, my whole goal was obviously to get my chance to keep playing out of college. And once they switched up the offensive system, they went into a pure running style quarterback. And uh, we finished the season with a... I think nine and two record overall or something like that. But um, the minute they made that switch, I met with the head coach and I already started to get my film out. I went through the recruiting process again and that's when I found my final school, which was UW Stown, Wisconsin, which was for my senior year. And I left as a, in December, right when the season ended to go over there for my final year. Yeah, that's a, a, a that's probably one of the shortest distances I think you've traveled in, during your career right now. It's, it's a hop, skip, and a jump from Delaware to Wisconsin. I, I've been to Wisconsin, uh, but that's the farthest that I've been other than to Pittsburgh. But when you traveled your senior year and you played in nine games, mostly in some pretty dire straight type situations or maybe even a backup duty, uh, did you find yourself – Putting it all, did you put it all on your shoulder during that time that you were on the field? I mean, did you feel as though that you had to overcome, do this yourself? Yeah, I mean, overall, like, I got brought in a lot of situations where we were down. Um, I helped us on the road at uh, Mayfield State with a nice, like, I let us out of, the, out of the halftime, I let us down the field for a touchdown, and we ended up winning that game by three points. Um, just overall, that was another experience where I was looking at it from the standpoint that I got to get as much film as I possibly can out of this thing, because obviously it wasn't the best situation for me. Um, they played an underclassman who they were grooming for the future, which I understood it. It was frustrating, obviously, because I feel I should have been the guy. And, um, I just took it for what it was worth. I knew that if I could get enough film from here, I would get an opportunity to keep playing down the road. And I made the best out of a very difficult situation. I think that's an ongoing theme for you, playing through dire situations. The colleges that didn't treat you so well, those coaches that left or rather dismissed or whatever the situation was behind it, I think all of those have really built to your character as a person. It enables you to become that much more aware of what's going on around you so the naivety is not there. It, it, it's almost non-existent. When you look at 
where you're where you're at in life right now, and personally as well as professionally, if an NFL team was to call you, and I know you'd be obviously excited and as if it was a draft day all over again, but if an NFL team was to call you, do you believe in your heart of hearts and who you are on the inside as well as knowing what type of professional player you are, could you put those together in such a way that would make you go out there with a chip on your shoulder to that NFL team's tryout to get it done? And we seem to have lost connection again with Dan. So Dan, if an NFL team was to call you, what would you say to them? Got a bad connection problem here. Getting near the good stuff, too. This is Rudy Reyes on the Rude Dog Show on the Two Lives Radio Network. I, if I had commercials, I'd run them. But I want to announce something here right on the Rude Dog Show. I normally would go to co- a commercial break. But go to the RudeDogShow.com forward slash partnerships. And you will find Athlete Scouting. It's a new partner here on the RuDog Show, among the other ones that I've helped create over some time in this industry doing this. Do we have Dan back on the phone? Dan, are you there? Yeah, I'm right here. Great, thank you. If an NFL team wants to call you, give you the rundown, give you the skinny, say this is what you have to do, give you the outline, give you the guidelines, would you be able to make that hot? to Atlanta and give it your absolute best to make sure that you get a spot on that roster. Yeah, I mean, I believe I'm one of those guys that I'm a grinder. Obviously, I'm going to pour my heart and soul into everything I'm doing on once I step in the field and off the field in the classroom. I'm going to learn. I'm going to grow. Um, even just running a private school and helping an organization out the best I could. Um, I definitely think I can bring value any roster that ever gave me a chance and it's just something that if it's if it's meant to happen it's going to happen i keep taking opportunities as they come obviously the last few months playing arena ball in jacksonville playing in the top level in germany playing in finland i keep taking jobs that i keep progressing as a player as well i keep getting more knowledge with the game i keep getting more experience i get more film and it's just overall one of those climbs where you're always trying to get better. You're always trying to progress. It's, it's it's about progression. It's about understanding that maybe if I do this, this will put me in a better situation. Maybe if I can shape that up a little bit or mold that a little bit better, that will enable me to become a highlight or a spotlight to whatever team dares to call you. And I think that you're certainly on your way. Looking at your resume, you've played with a wide array from teams in Europe to California teams to East Coast teams in Delaware and and New Jersey at prep school. I mean, you have a variety of not only football knowledge, not only professional knowledge, but personal knowledge as well. Those all work in your favor. Look, an NFL team would be more than suited to contact Danny Farley. And and here's my list, and here's why I believe Danny will be an asset to an NFL roster. He's well-versed, he's well-schooled. He hasn't gotten in any trouble, he keeps his nose to the grindstone. The only time he lifts is up when he has to blow his nose. Other than that, he's driving, he's nailing, he's progressive, he's well-learned, he's well-schooled, he's well-educated in life as well as in football. He deserves an opportunity at an NFL level. I'm talking to you Colts, I'm talking to all those teams that have problems with quarterbacks Right now, you know who you are. Cam Newton, certainly not able to get it done. I know you want a big athletic guy, Carolina, but if a guy by the name of Cam Newton cannot take full reps in training camp or in OTAs, and you have Andrew Luck over in Indianapolis who still has yet to see any time on the field, you would be silly to not contact Danny Farmer. It's just... It's just one of those things. You want a clean-cut guy with a clean-cut attitude who already understands football. He will adapt to your system. He will be an integral part of your system. Contact Danny Farley. 
It's not hard to find him. He may be in Finland, but as you can tell through our interview, he's been everywhere. That song keeps rolling in my head again, Danny, just so you know. <laughs> I've been everywhere. Okay, so look, you spent four months of preseason. You attended the NFL Regional Combine in New Orleans. You were with the uh, Combines in Calgary, Saskatchewan, but you didn't get a call for draft week. However, you did get signatures from the Falcons and the Vikings. Is there a short list that you're on right now? Seem to have a bad connection again. It just seems to drop off here. But he's had interest in the Falcons and the Vikings. He's played in two games. Uh, in the Germany Football League, top in all of Europe at 11-11 outdoor. He spent a month playing four games in the, for the Saarland Hurricanes before the German national team had their quarterback return from an injury. So clearly that didn't work out for him there. But he left from Germany to Finland. I guess there's something about Europe that he likes. Dan, are you there? Cannot hear Dan at all. But now he is playing another Premier League in, in Europe, 11-on-11 11 11 for the Porvo Butchers. They're currently in third place. They have an opportunity, an automatic playoff berth with two wins Remaining in the regular season. I say wins because I believe they'll win. I don't get a chance to watch that kind of football here. However, I am very interested in trying to find out what that is all about there in Germany for the Portable Butcher. But it looks like he's on his way. He has the attitude, he has the personality. Are you back with me, Dan? All right, are you back? Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. But you spent some time in Calgary, Saskatchewan. You played in two games uh, before getting called to play in the Germany Football League. What was it like playing for an 11-11 outdoor Portville Butchers? Connection keeps coming out. Yeah, no, I understand. But you guys are doing fantastic. Just keep trying to call back. That's all I can say. Future goals remain having to get into the NFL and or even the CFL team because I think that's going to be the next It's the next logical step when you talk about getting into the CFL and you have an opportunity for NFL scouts and then they do this. The Steelers have done it. Every team at least. We had one team recently who signed a former Olympic uh, track star. So the clear there's opportunities for anybody because they want speed and speed kills. And speaking of speed, maybe the speedy connection will uh, be the <laughs> the go-to. Are you with me, Ed? Back. Now we're going to have to have keep back here. But I, I look at this next obvious component, and that is in the CFL. I think that, and, and matter of fact, I was talking to uh, another gentleman, uh, Paul Paul Porras, who's played in the, the, the Japanese X League, and Dan, are you back? Yeah, it's gonna, yeah, yeah, it's gonna hear me. Yeah, I, I can hear you fine. What is it about playing in the NFL that really has you ready to go? Moments of notes. Um, I think just overall experience um, playing eleven on eleven football overseas. There's some really good competition. There's some guys out here who have already had opportunities to play in the pros. So you are playing some professional level talent. There's some NFL private squad guys that fall through the cracks and end up over here in Europe. And there's guys that are trying to get back into the NFL from Europe. So either way, you're playing against good competition. You're still getting better every game. You're still learning a lot about the game. And overall game experience, like we talked about earlier, can get you a long way. It can. Life experience along with football experience, along with having the educational aspects to share those experiences with others is invaluable. I know a lot of times in the NFL, you'll find guys who are the next up and comers that don't receive the type of help that would benefit them. But again, it's about the mentality of the team, the mentality of that individual player to say, either I'm here to help him or I'm all about me and I'm not gonna bother giving my backup any help whatsoever. And you're gonna find that a lot in the NFL. I mean, guys, like Tom Brady and his underwinging of Jacoby Brissett, uh, to, to some degree, there's been some type of conversation. 
uh, Jimmy Garoppolo, uh, defending Super Bowl 51 winners, talking about that relationship. When you get into a system and you know you're going to need the information from that starting quarterback, what ways would you go about getting the necessary info, the, the intel, that would help you even further understand not only the offense, but to try to aspire to what that starting quarterback is doing? Bad connection. Good old, good old finish. And the finish to that one. Are you are you with me, Dan? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can hear you. I was talking about Jimmy Garoppolo and Jacoby Brissett for the New England Patriots having to learn under a guy like Tom Brady. He's won the Super Bowl five times, defending Super Bowl champions, I might add. But is there some type of way that you were able to grasp or grab or ask the right questions to grab the intel from a starting quarterback so that way you can acclimate yourself? even further to possibly one day get started? Um, I think the biggest thing if you look at the Patriots situation over there is Garoppolo's in a very good position to learn under a very good coach and he has Brady over there. You're seeing everything Brady does, every drill he's in, every rep he takes. You're staying after watching film with him as much as you can. You're trying to learn as much as you can about the game from that guy. Obviously, he's probably the best ever. And in terms of playing the position, a lot of people if you're in a situation like that and you're a young guy coming out of college, it's a great situation for you to just be in that system, be in that organization. You get to run, you have reps, you get to learn a lot, and then obviously you get to apply it to your own skill set. The more reps you get, the better off you're in. I, I completely agree with you. A lot more often you're going to find that, and unless you're Unless you're fear, or unless they just don't like you, and in that case, why are you even on the roster? Because it could be a waste of your time as well as theirs. But when you're able to befriend the starting quarterback, and I know there's a lot of backup quarterbacks in NFL history as an example, where they feel as though they're the ones on the outside looking in. Uh, I'll give you a really good case in point, Bruce Gronkowski and Ben Roethlisberger. Gronkowski came in. But very seldomly, very rarely did he find time to be on the field with Ben Roethlisberger. But how can you not learn anything? Bruce Gronkowski was former as well, who came over in free agency. His dad used to work for organization and so on. But when you look at what Gronkowski had learned from Ben Roethlisberger, I think that if you were to give him an opportunity to play a real-time game, Charlie Batch, Charlie Batch did as well. Charlie Batch came in. M&T Stadium a couple of years ago before uh, he decided to call it quits and, and deviate from football altogether. That's did it underneath Ben Roethlisberger. Even though Charlie Betts was an elder statesman, he still got it done. That's a reliable quarterback who learned something from Ben Roethlisberger. He learned something from Bruce Gronkowski. He learned from a lot of variety of sources. Dan, is it going to be easy for you to acclimate to the NFL if given the opportunity to maybe even be a backup? on an NFL roster. Are you with me, Dan? That connection is just not very good. Good old finish. Good old finish connection. I think Danny's onto something here. And when I say onto something, I mean he is moving in the right direction. The problem is that father time can be the difference between you making it to the next level and you not making it to the next level. That's one of the reasons why Danny is still striving, still moving, still trying to do everything he can to get to the next level. And that is the NFL. And even if it is a CFL, then so be it. But he's certainly making a case for himself now and having him on the Rudolph Show has enabled me to further understand where he's been, where he could go, and I look at, Dan, I, I look at where you're going, and I look at the trials and tribulations that, that you have faced. What keeps you motivated? What keeps you going? What keeps you driven? Are you there, Dan? Yeah, that's um, that's something that he's going to have to contend with. I mean, I look at NFL teams who could use a quarterback right now. We could talk about Colin Kaepernick and how he hasn't found. And, yeah, I think it's a worn-out conversation in, in, in reality. Say, like, does Kaepernick deserve a spot? Yes. 
Why hasn't he achieved this spot yet? Well, only NFL owners know. Only they know what's going on. Talk about Jay Cutler, another quarterback. Started with the Dolphins. That's where he's at. That's, that's you know, and it didn't start there, but that could very well be where it ends for Jay Cutler in a $10 million one-year deal. I look at the Miami Dolphins. I don't really foresee them having a very good um, a good system. Even though they have Jay Cutler, I, I just don't know that, that Jay Cutler has – what it takes to help get the Dolphins. Is, is it a very similar situation? Yes. For Tannehill. Are you with me, Dan? Yeah, I'm back. Okay, thank you. So we were talking about your goals, your your aspirations, despite all civics. What keeps you driven? What what keeps you motivated? What keeps you going? Just success. Um, obviously, I want to keep playing as long as I can. I mean, it's obviously a job now. But at the same time, it's just, I'm doing what I love in my life. I get to travel. I get to keep playing the game. And that's what's most important. It's a constant grind. It teaches you to just train all year round. You're always going through it. You're always trying to take care of yourself. You're always trying to do the right things. And overall, you get to keep climbing ladder, ladders. And I want to hopefully win a lot of championships, whatever level of competition I'm playing on. And... Obviously, I want to keep moving up and playing in the highest leagues possible. Well, I think you're on your way. I, I, I really do, from, from life's experience to personal experience to professional experience, facing the negatives, looking at some of the positives. But I look at your resume, and your resume is is, is loud. I mean, it, it, it's so loud that my, my, my eyes are burning. That's how loud it is to my eyes. You've had interest from the Falcons, interest from the Vikings, and... There are just so many things that can be said for who you are as a person, uh, what what and where you are at, and exactly what you have been doing to get yourself to the NFL, the CFL. And I think you're on your way. I, I think that this, this professional career that you're headed towards is going to take the next step. But again, you know this, and I don't have to tell you, you know. It takes commitment. It takes passion, drive, persistence, patience, and perseverance. And I've said that on the show before. Which one of those four do you think applies to you the most? Patience. Got to be really patient. Anytime you transfer as much as I have and you go through as many schools and situations as I have, you deal with a lot of heartbreak. Um, obviously, you stay determined, but the biggest thing is just you got to stay patient. You gotta really just focus on one day at a time. You gotta focus on just getting better one day at a time. You gotta focus on where you're at one day at a time because anytime you look ahead too far, you start just driving yourself nuts. You can. <laughs> if you're not patient, you're gonna find yourself racking your brain saying, well, why not me and why not this and why not that? It's not really a matter of that. Look, I have heard Many, many no's. Trust me. I have I've heard more no's, received more emails on thanks but no thanks, and I continue to do what I'm doing because eventually my passion is going to be my paycheck because someone's going to see what passion I have, how I deliver it, who I deliver it for, and the reasons behind how I do it. And they're going to recognize that I'm worth paying for. And you will end up being in the very same category. That's how I feel. That's how I look at it. That's what I notice. That's what I get out of our conversation. Despite the disconnects that we've had here, I understand you. So when, when I say I understand you, I understand you in the sense of I know where you're going. I know why you want to get there. I know for what reason you want to get there. Because it's not done. You want to prove something not only to anybody else. You want to prove it more yourself. Then in Spreaker live on Facebook. Make sure you tune in, get in the chat room, ask some questions. You can even ask on Twitter right now at Rudog Reyes. Throw me a follow. You can find this podcast after the editing process is done on the RudogShow.com. Make sure you check it out. I appreciate your listenership. I appreciate the ears you've given so far, and I appreciate your support amongst everything else. I just received some. Some interesting news, and I'll actually share this with you as well, Dan, in that 
I'm on TSPNN, and that's another radio entity, but they're in Canada. And I received some emails from some listeners, longtime listeners of TSPNN, and they had stated that, uh, why don't I have my own show? I like this guy. He's, you know, I've, I've noticed him before. I, I, I've listened to some of his stuff. I've watched him uh, live, or I went to therudolfshow.com. He has a good show. I don't know why he doesn't have his own show up here. And so I'm getting some Canadian love there. That's good. I like that. <laughs> So thank you everybody for listening. I, I do appreciate. It. I really do. I'm I'm probably as humble as you'll as you'll ever meet from someone. Uh, very very appreciative for all of that as well. Uh, Dan, are you back with me? I might take that as a no. Dan is not with me. Dan, I just wanted to say, are you there? I thank everybody for tuning in. This is Rudy Reyes right here on the Rudolph Show on the Two Lives Two's Radio Network. Trying to say thank you to Dan Farley. Uh, not really having a whole lot of luck there. Hopefully he'll call right back and I'll get some type of answer from him. But uh, I just want to thank everybody. I want to thank Canadian uh, ears as well. I want to thank Canada for their for their support and and, and their showing. Dan, are you with me? Hello. Are you, are you there, Dan? Yeah. Can okay. You? Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Hey, man. I want to appreciate that. Despite all the disconnects, you're a trooper. I appreciate you hanging in there. Thank you very much for having me today. No, I'm hey. A lot of fun here. Good, man. I'm glad. That's kind of the point to be here on the Rudolph Show. So not only keep you entertained, but uh, to to really just enjoy, and hopefully get you some exposure and have some NFL teams call you. Look, if you don't know. Danny Farley, you're missing out. If you haven't called him, you're missing out. If you haven't spoken to him, you're really missing out. Call Danny Farley. Contact Danny Farley. He's not hard to find. I mean, maybe in Finland, but that doesn't mean he's impossible to find. I'm just going to put that out there. But, hey, Dan, thank you so much. And please let me know what's going on. If there's anything else I can do for you, please let me know, okay? Really appreciate it, Rudy. No, not a problem at all. Absolutely. Thanks, Dan. Take care. And uh, good things out in Finland, where you're at. Really appreciate that. Take care. You too. Thank you. Uh, Danny Farley, love talking to this guy. I know it was a little hodgepodge, but you got to make it work out of roll to punches. It's just the way it is. This is Rudy Reyes of the Root Dog Show on the Two Lights Two's Radio Network. Again, I want to thank the Canadian fans. I want to thank the U.S. fans. I want to thank everybody for their support. I do appreciate it. I try to say as often as possible because that's a reality. That is a true reality of it. Everybody needs to know that they're appreciated. Their time is well spent and that their time is also appreciated. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And look forward to uh, seeing you guys tomorrow on Facebook Live and on Spreaker. Make sure you go to therudogshow.com. Throw me a follow at Rudog Reyes on Twitter. And give me a like on my Facebook page. All that information is available on therudogshow.com. This is Rudy Reyes. On the Rudolph Show, on the two Lions 2's radio network. Everybody have a great day.